So welcome everyone. I'll give you a couple minutes to uh, find your seats. So we want to get started. Um, we have a lot of people to thank uh, for organizing this amazing event. Um, first of all, Richard Raisman over here, uh, who put in a number of hours and days into organizing this event and getting this great panel. Um, Jim Clyburn back there. Uh, thank you, Jim, for uh, hosting us. And our sponsor, I'm going to let Richard uh, finish off the thank yous. Um, the MIT Enterprise Forum is actually a, an organization that uh, tries to have you know, panels on an ongoing basis with thought leaders. And I, I can't think of a more topical conversation to have than cybersecurity the day before the election. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to be uh, stepping off very quickly, but I want to encourage you to uh, you know, consider membership. We have a lot of exciting events coming up. And, um, and with that, let me introduce uh, Richard. My name is Richard Raisman. Thank you, Chris. And I also wanted to recognize Tammy Sachs, who helped put this together. Tammy, are you around somewhere? There she I'm is. Here. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, well, cybersecurity, everybody talks about cybersecurity. But um, I think I'm uh, very excited about this particular panel. And uh, we're very fortunate we have the entire panel. But forgive me just picking out two of the panelists who are the principal research scientists who came down from Cambridge for this. They're members of the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, CSAIL, which is really the pre premier artificial intelligence uh, research organization, I think, in the world. Of course, we're the MIT Enterprise Forum, so we, we would say that. But I think that most people would agree to it. Uh, I looked up some statistics. I'm not going to go down all the statistics, but uh, everybody knows cybersecurity is important. The uh, global loss in, uh, for cybersecurity attacks uh, this year was $400 billion, and it's estimated to go up in two years to $2 trillion. So uh, what we're talking about today is uh, very significant. We do have two sponsors that uh, Chris mentioned, but I wanted to just recognize them. Uh, the first is Synopsis, and uh, we have uh, from Synopsis uh, Jess Rosenthal. You hear Jess? Thank you, Richard. Just briefly want to introduce who the heck Synopsis is. I assume no one here knows us. Um, we, hey, thank you. Um, we are an, an, a software application security testing company. What we do is we provide a range of software testing tools to, to help people find security vulnerabilities early in the development cycle before they ever hit the wild. Um, it's designed for people who either design their own code or purchase code. Uh, we can also say that we announced an acquisition about two hours ago uh, that we, it's fresh off the press. We just acquired Sigital, which is the leading uh, software security uh, consulting and advising company that helps people design software into their, into their uh, processes. So that acquisition just came through tonight. Um, we have a little table outside with some literature, and if you, have any inf if you want any more information afterwards, I'll be standing out there, and Brian, wherever you are, raise your hand. He'll be joining me at the table, so we'd be glad to offer some more information. And thank you very much for allowing us to be here. Uh, our other host is a Hughes Hubbard with this beautiful space. Uh, afterwards, you can look at the Statue of Liberty out there and Staten Island and a few other famous places. And I wanted to uh, introduce uh, 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 Seth Rothman from Hughes Hubbard. Yeah, I'm uh, Seth Rothman. I'm co-chair of the cybersecurity group here at Hughes Hubbard. And I just want to welcome everybody to the firm. We're uh, very pleased and very happy to be hosting this event tonight. So the, uh, is there a joke about it? I have to apologize. It wouldn't be so brief. So I want to thank, thank, you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, last uh, last thing, uh, person I want to uh, introduce is Sasha Manasing, who's with the MIT Enterprise Forum. She's going to give you just a preview of what we have coming up. Good evening. Uh, 
Um, I know we're all excited for cybersecurity, but I just um, wanted to draw your attention to a couple of the fall events that we're having. Um, actually, our program runs throughout the year, so we have roughly one a month. Um, coming up, uh, we'll have next up a blockchain event in, later in November. Then in December, early December, we have a VR event. And next year, we kick off with Joe Eater from MIT from CSAIL. So um, if any of those are interesting to you, as the program rolls out, you'll find that we have lots of interesting things on the agenda. Um, and we enjoy, like, we enjoy having you know, people cross, um, cross disciplines, across functions to learn about other things with us. So if you're interested, um, please talk to Colette um, at the door about membership. Um, and then if you, actually, if you paid for your ticket tonight, it'll go towards your membership dues. Um, so, uh, enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you so much for coming. This last is my swan song. One more introduction. Uh, uh, the uh, moderator of our panel tonight is uh, Steve Russo. Steve is a fellow emeritus at the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton University, and he coaches the cybersecurity and privacy team at Holland and Knight. Steve. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, and so I've got some more introductions, which is just what we need, right? So, um, but it's really great to be here. Um, thanks to the MIT uh, um, Enterprise Forum for uh, putting this together. So first, uh, without further ado, on our panel, we've got Dina Kaufman. She is a managing director at uh, BDO Consulting in their technology and advisory services practice. Uh, Dina. Raise your hand, although it's obviously your question. Hard to tell me from the other panel. I know, I know, right? <laughs> and um, we've got Joe Jarzenbeck, um, who was formerly director for software and supply chain assurance in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, uh, Office of Cybersecurity and Communications, currently global manager for software supply chain management at um, Synopsys. Howard Schrobe, director of cybersecurity and a principal research scientist at MIT uh, CSAIL. And, um, and this one took some practice, but um, and Kalyan Viramachanini, no, sorry, <laughs> Kalyan Viramachanini, research scientist uh, also at CSAIL. Now, the structure of what we have tonight, um, we have a couple of sort of discrete presentations that will flow into one another. We're going to begin with um, discussion from uh, our guest from MIT on machine learning and artificial intelligence as it relates to uh, cybersecurity. Um, we're also going to have a discussion then about um, uh, evolving computer uh, architectures, uh, both at the uh, OS and hardware level, and things that can be done to increase security and reliability. From there, we're going to shift over a little to IoT and some supply chain assurance issues, which just you know couldn't possibly be more important today with the way things are going. And then we're going to wrap it all up with uh, incident response and preparation um, with Dina. But anyway, again, without further ado, so. Perfect. Thanks, thanks for having me. I'm Kalyan Virmachanini. I, um, I'm also part of a new institute in, within an institute, MIT Institute for Data Systems and Society. I also co-founded a startup called PatternX three years ago, and most of this work actually belongs to PatternX and is in collaboration with PatternX. So I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence, what, what is it for InfoSec in terms of artificial intelligence, and uh, how that is different and how that is very challenging from what I've done uh, before. Uh, in that same space, my machine learning, but not for security. Artificial intelligence and machine learning, but not for security. Um, so what does it mean for AI? I mean, I just want to know, any, if, what does it mean to be building an AI system or a machine learning system? What does it serve? Anyone? I mean, in cybersecurity, help eliminate false positives and, and learn what's going on with normal and abnormal behavior to make humans' jobs easier so they don't have to sift through thousands of false events and false alarms. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I think predictions, to so be able to do predictions and reduce false positives so that the humans don't have to sift through hundreds of thousands of events or hundreds of thousands of data points, which they can't actually in, in real time. So that's the purpose of AI, but I will show you how 
current systems are not able to serve that pro purpose really well. Uh, well, and what's the what's the problem? So. A little bit about my background. I come from machine learning and, and uh, application. I did a lot of applications uh, with machine learning, and applications like predict a patient, uh, predict if a patient is going to sh not going to show up for an appointment, a doctor's appointment, or predict what music you might like when you're driving a car from home to gym or gym to workplace, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you like this movie, what else would you like? All these problems, it was not just me who was trying to solve these problems using machine learning and data mining. A lot of my colleagues and a lot of my peers were trying to solve the same problems too. But in each of these problems, we had data from the past, and almost in every case, we had occurrences of what we were trying to predict in that data. So for example, if you're trying to predict whether somebody's going to show up for a doctor's appointment or not, if you have enough data about their appointments from past year, you will find out that sometimes they did not show up for an appointment and sometimes they did, and you can find out what the reasons were, what patterns led to them sh not showing up or showing up. And the, perhaps the most important one is stationarity. In almost all cases, if you found a pattern that correlates with, with, uh, with an outcome, and if you can use that pattern for prediction, it doesn't, that correlation doesn't necessarily change over time. So if, I, if, we, if you found from a machine learning system that if the doctor's appointment is between 8 and 10 a.m. in the morning, it's absolutely, uh, you can be sure that I won't show up for the appointment. That pattern won't change unless something changes significantly in my life. So most of the times it's the stationarity that we assumed when we built the systems and we tried to learn the systems. Why is InfoSec different? First of all, when I started InfoSec, so InfoSec is not my area. As I said, I'm a machine learning person. So when I started InfoSec, I went, I, I collaborated with these guys who were doing this startup. And I said, well, if you want to predict attacks ahead of times, are there past occurrences of those data to learn what leads to them? And in almost all cases in an enterprise, the answer was no. We don't have any labeled data. We call that labeled data. So we don't have any past occurrences of the same attack. And in some cases, when we did have occurrences in the data of, of such attacks, we actually, and I said, well, what if we built the model to predict them? And they said, well, it's almost useless because nobody's attacking us that way anymore. Because the attackers have figured out that that's the, you know, that you know it too when they are trying to attack it that way, and we have preventative measures so nobody's going to attack. So that's the problem that we, that we encountered as soon as we tried to apply machine learning or AI systems for cybersecurity. So what was there? And then we went, went around and saw what was there, and as you mentioned, uh, this is one of the most popular paradigms to use in machine learning, which is unsupervised machine learning system, where you start with some logs data, you try to identify some patterns, which we can also call behavioral indicators, depending upon the, the data source, and you try to build something called an anomaly detector. In many cases, it was just a multivariate distribution, and you're looking for events at the tail of that distribution, and you show them to the analyst as alarms, the ones that are highly unlikely in that distribution, highly unlikely events or rare events, you try to show them to the analyst and say, well, these must be attacks. And that, was, that is the state of the art. That, is, that still is the state of the art when they try to use machine learning for, for, for cybersecurity. The problem with that is not all of those alarms are actually, uh, the, not all of those outliers or rare events are actually attacks. So here's just one, one example where we get a very high outlier score for this particular pattern but when somebody actually looked at that pattern, an analyst looked at the pattern, and he said, this is not an attack. This is just a manually con configured NTP system. So I actually don't know what that means, but that's what the security <laughs> analyst annotated it, that this is not an attack, right? So you, you can't ask me a question about this one. But that's, actually, I, re I say that because there's a nice interplay between machine learning people and analysts, uh, security analysts, to be able to build these systems. You can't build any of these systems in isolation. They can't build without machine learning, and machine learning people cannot build a system without their help. Uh, similarly, we had another pattern where we had hundreds of thousands of connections from random remote destinations for the same source and thousands of sessions. And it did not get a high outlier score. It actually got low outlier score, but this was an attack. When an analyst looked at it, he was able to confirm that this was actually an attack. So as a result, how did, how did an analyst do this? When we d dug a little bit deeper, it, it turned out that they had a lot of subjective assessment based on their intuition. Sometimes they looked at multiple events simultaneously and we didn't, have, we didn't build a machine learning system to do that. Uh, they were also collating pieces of information from external sources 
and awareness that they had from other sources and so on and so forth. When they pulled all of that together, they can actually tag that this is an attack and this is not an attack. So our goal was, next goal was, how can we replicate that using machine learning? And that's the part where we went ahead and we started building a supervised learning system where once we show analysts and they tag events, we take those events and we build with the same data, we built a supervised machine learning algorithm that is able to predict those events given the data. So once we build that, we call that virtual analyst, and we update this virtual analyst every night. So every day we show, throughout the day we show analysts some events that we think are possible attacks. The analyst tags which ones are, which ones are not. And, next, and we build a virtual analyst, and we can use that virtual analyst next day in, together with the outlier detection system. So that combination actually is very helpful. And as you can imagine, it now cuts down the time in terms of analysts looking through all those events because now we can use virtual analyst the next day around. And we do the same thing. We can actually use that virtual analyst for historical data too, just in case something was missed in last one week or last one month and so on and so forth. So that little mix, actually, if we go back to our example, and we bring this example because this is a real problem that actually happened in one of our enterprise uh, clients. So if you look at this problem, we, we had this low outlier score, but it was malicious. The analyst tagged it. Next day, we built that model that will predict if it were to happen again. And, the, and once the analyst tagged 10 of such events, we were able to use a virtual analyst model the next day and be able to show 27 confirmed attacks now detected through that virtual analyst or a machine learning model. So there's a nice interplay between the machine learning system as well as the analyst in terms of building these, these, these models and being able to use this. The big, the big thing also, again, is that you have to update these models every day. Uh, that is not what, as machine learning people who built models for stationary systems where we assumed stationarity to a certain degree, uh, we were not used to doing those updations in, in almost real time or almost on a daily basis. So that's one of the biggest innovation here, in addition to taking that analyst feedback and building machine learning models. But what, what are the challenges? It's not new to get human input and build models in machine learning or AI. It has been done for computer vision. That's how computer vision people build models. They show images to a lot of crowdsourced workers, and they get tags as to what is in the image, and they build a computer model to predict that for a new image. The challenge here is it's not a crowdsourcing problem, it's an expert sourcing problem. Not everyone, including myself, can look at a stream of log events and tell which one is an attack, which one is not. So there's a very limited pool of people that can actually look at data and say this is an attack or this is not an attack. And that's one of the biggest challenges in InfoSec space. It's not easy to build an AI system um, much like other, other places. Uh, of course, the limited bandwidth. And also, what do we show the analyst is again a challenge. How do we present the information, the, the events, and how, what summaries do we present uh, to the analyst for them to be able to make a judgment on, on certain events is again a big challenge. So that's what we have been tackling for a lot of uh, 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 data sources that we have and a lot of companies that we are working with. I just wanted to quickly go over one result that, is, that, is in, that, that has resulted from this research. It's actually a practical system. We, this is all data from a real uh, client in a real system over a period of three months. Uh, so the blue line, I just wanted to go over just this plot. Uh, the x-axis is the amount of events that we showed the analyst on a daily basis. On the y-axis is the number of true positives, which means how many attacks, percentage of attacks that we were able to detect accurately from the data. So the green line is what this, what is the state of the art system, machine learning system that most of the infosec uh, you know, vendors are providing, as well as what, what companies and enterprises are using after building them internally, and that's simply an outlier detection system. And the blue line is, of course, a combination of that outlier detection system with analyst feedback and so on and so forth. Uh, so the higher the curve, the better. And what we see is we can get almost close to what the blue line can give in terms of accuracy, in terms of predictive accuracy, in terms of the number of attacks it can detect, if we increase the analyst budget to 1,000, which means if we show the analyst 1,000 events, um, in this case, uh, web log events, that's when it's able to, it's not still not able to achieve the one that is blue line, but it's able to at least get closer to it. But the blue line actually, the, the, the curve that we, we, we show comes from an active learning system, which is our system, you can achieve a similar accuracy just by showing 200 events. 
So in a, in a sense, when we took feedback from analysts and we updated those models on a daily basis, uh, we are able to achieve the same detection rate by showing far less events, one-fifth of the events, to, to, the, to the analyst, which is essentially reducing the false positives by one-fifth. So that's the purpose of this whole system, going back and forth with analysts on a daily basis. And this is a plot averaged over three months. So I think I have a, I put myself a stop sign so that I can stop. Otherwise, I can go on. There are more slides. <coughs> go ahead. Yeah, a couple questions that came to mind. First of all, once you've identified that something is malicious, uh, how do you correlate whether or not your system is vulnerable to that and whether it's an exploit has succeeded? And then to follow that, if it is vulnerable, what about mitigation of the attack? Assuming that it's beyond the distributed denial of service attack, which has other uh, approaches to mitigate, but so how, would you, how would you handle that? So I think right now we, we come up and saying that this is a confirmed malicious attack, and there's actually categories to those attacks because analysts are able to tag as well as name them. They think that this is this account takeover attack or this is this kind of attack and so on and so forth. So we are now able to confirm that that's the kind of attack, and then we, we are still investigating what are the mitigation strategies that they employ, and can we automate that as well so that they don't have to go and do that and we can automatically do that. But we haven't actually... It's something that's like hammered against your system that you don't have a vulnerability for. It doesn't matter. I mean, you, you can just then black all that IP and it will go away. They do that, yes. Yeah. They do that. So it's such things where it doesn't actually matter. Yeah. We can now automate those actions ourselves. So we don't have to wait for that to show the analyst and have them take the action. We can actually just automate that action. So there's some actions we are able to. If it doesn't succeed, if it's not going to ever succeed. Yes. Not running IIS and you're trying an IIS profile attack. Yes. The, zero, the first time they're attacked. So I think we have also started to invest in um, taking models from one um, uh, enterprise to another. So as a result, there is some inherent transfer of information as well as models, predictive models, and we use them in the next enterprise on its first day. So that's one way of getting up and started, but that doesn't necessarily address if it's a brand new attack. So our hope is that with a brand new attack, they will appear somewhere as rare events, and then we will be able to have an analyst tag it at one enterprise. And as soon as they tag it, we have the predictive model that night, and we are able to use it every, everywhere it's else at all. I can also do the data science on you, figure out where to put the zero data, which internet of things, where I'm going to put that. Yeah, I think that that's why the non-station assumption of non-stationarity and updates is extremely important. Well, beyond that, we, we have a game here, not just non-stationarity. Excuse me. Okay, I want to think about it as an adversarial game. Absolutely. Not just non-stationarity. Absolutely. Not Go to it. Just randomly, obliviously. Yeah, absolutely. I think we are we are actually one of my research projects, not at the company, is to build an adversarial system to this system. And what that entails is, and I want to stick to using machine learning when I build that system. So what that means is all the attackers can pool their data as to what, when they were able to penetrate and when they were not. And can they learn from it a strategy so that they can now penetrate through the existing preventative system? And once that happens, what will happen at the other side? If the, if the system where it's updated every day and new things are shown every day, if that exists on the other side, can we prevent it? So you need to also put a utility. Okay. What do they get? Who is doing it? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. I think I'll crowdsource the moderator function. This is <laughs> <laughs> the uh, no. And we're, we'll have um, if we have some time at the end, either as part of the panel to have additional questions, or um, to ask folks to uh, uh, even informally then as well. But Howard, uh, yeah. next up, great. So, um, as was mentioned earlier, I'm the director of our research partnership called Cybersecurity at CSAIL, which is a partnership with about eight companies right now. Um, should any of you be interested in joining, we're always happy to talk about it, but I'm not trying to do a hard sell at all right now. Um, the kind of work that Kalyan just talked about is a great deal of the work that goes on in the lab. That is work focused on analysis and detection. 
Uh, what I want to talk about is another thread, which is work focused on protection, in particular building systems that are inherently secure. Um, I wanted to start off with a little bit of entertainment. I was at a forum last week on I IoT security. And I have many more of these particularly bizarre things like hackable internet Barbie dolls. Um, and um, of course, the big thing that came up last week was the Mirai attack. Um, so this was the big DOS attack. Most of you know about this. Um, the key point about this attack was the botnet used to launch the attack was a novel set of devices, namely primarily digital recorders, DVRs, secondarily online cameras, and a few other kinds of devices. I think actually second largest was home routers. Now, the key thing to know about this attack, oh, let me go back, is that the main vector of attack was completely simple. Namely, most of these devices are shipped with a default password and user login name. The attack has a t table of those. It tries them. If it <coughs> succeeds, it logs on, downloads the payload, runs the payload, which repeats that process, and then sets up a contact to the command and control system. So the first thing to notice here is a really devastating attack. The enabler for it was a simple property of having stupid logins and not having dual factor authentication. Um, I'm going to skip this. Well, actually, this is very quick. Let me show you this because I want to be a little entertaining. This is a cyber attack that was done as an experiment at the uh, Idaho Falls National Lab. The date's up there. And what they demonstrated, what the attack did was simply throw a breaker out of phase with the power line. And the reactive power coming back into the generator, if you do it enough times, breaks the generator pretty convincingly. Um, and so this is an example of why we're very worried about cyber attacks in the Internet of Things world, particularly the industrial Internet of Things, or maybe even better named the infrastructure Internet of Things. And then this one, um, I worked at DARPA twice, most recently from 2010 to 13. Uh, this was a piece that 60 Minutes did about the office at DARPA that I worked in. Uh, they made this slightly after I left, so I don't get to be the guy in the car with the 60 Minutes reporter. But uh, let me show you this. Whoops. This is a regular new car. The masking tape is only there because we agreed to obscure its make and model. We'll give them the illusion they control the car for now. Carlin that was my has been working on this for five years with multiple research teams. Want to hit the fluids? Oh my gosh! There we go. There we go. What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? <laughs> yeah, the windshield wiper fluid. <laughs> no wait, is, is, so this is something that a hacker had. <laughs> That's right, a hacker. Like obviously, you didn't turn on the windshield I wiper. Not. <laughs> Using a laptop, the hacker dialed the car's emergency communication system and transmitted a series of tones that flooded it with data. As the car's computer tried sorting it out, the hacker inserted an attack that reprogrammed the software, gaining total remote control. Oh, oh my God. Oh, <laughs> So these are some cases where um, you'd really like this never to happen rather than to figure it out as it happens. Um, this work drew on a number of different research projects, but the earliest one was a project called CarShark that was done jointly by researchers at UCSD and the University of Washington. And this chart comes from that project. What they did was they sort of did a very systematic analysis of how information flows through a modern car. Um, 
which is, of course, an interesting thing to think about because we didn't used to talk about cars that way. But cars are, of course, a rolling cloud on wheels. And one of the things they do, so they break these attacks up into different categories. Some require direct physical access, like using the diagnostic port. But then you'll notice all the rest involve non-physical contact through short-range wireless, long-range wireless, um, and indirect close physical contact. So some of those involve things like carefully crafting a CD so that when you put it in, it plays the music you think it will, but it also does some other things like take over the car. Um, or using Bluetooth from re close proximity to take over the car. Now, without going into lots of detail, for, first there's look at the column that says full control, uh, which is uniformly yes. <laughs> and um, the cost is not high in most cases, so it's not impossible for the attacker to mount this. The, it, some of these are visible to the user, some aren't. But the main thing, which isn't so clear here, is that the vehicle for almost every one of these attacks is some violation of memory safety. That is a buffer overflow style of attack. So the point I wanted to make here is that if you look at the set of attacks I've been showing you, um, in contrast to the general feeling we have is that this is just overwhelming cybersecurity. It's also complicated. There's nothing we can do about it. In fact, the root causes here, which are exploited in millions of different ways, but the root causes are actually relatively small, maybe countable on a couple of hands, and could actually be fixed. So what I want to argue is that there's a few ways we could go about this. There may be some others. And I want to show you some examples of those things. First of all, by background, how did we get here? Well, um, I come from MIT. Uh, I went to MIT because I was very interested in this Multics project, which was going on in the um, 70s. Uh, started a little earlier than that. By the time I got there in 73, it was sort of over. Um, Multics, that's the machine, <laughs> GE645. And um, Multics was a three-way partnership, MIT, GE and Bell Labs. The Bell Labs people got a little tired of waiting for this magic system to arrive. Um, Multics was designed as a computing utility, think cloud in today's terms. And because it was a shared resource, it focused a lot on security and the design. But the mechanism used in Multics to enforce that, which is called virtual memory, at the time was way too expensive. Now, you can't buy a chip today that does not have those mechanisms in it. Um, so what happened is Bell Labs sort of pulled out a bunch of crazy guys up in the attic, actually very literally in the attic. I worked at Bell, on site at Bell Labs for Honeywell a little later on, and um, these guys were in the attic. And they got this uh, departmental mini computer, a PDP, PDP-11, and they built this much stripped down system called Unix, which was written in a language they had developed called C, which we still use for system programming which was stripped down so that it could get you the performance you needed, uh, but enforced no properties of interest at all. And we're still using that. The rest of these machines show how things evolved over time. This was one of the first engineering workstations, the IBM PC, and now smartphones. Now, the interesting thing is that if you compare that 645 machine to your smartphone, things have gotten better by roughly 50,000 times on every factor of interest. Uh, including even pixels, because after all, the Multics machine worked on a teletype. Um, so um, now, because they were operating in an era where resources were dear, machines were not.